Let's open our Bibles to the book of Ezra. We're in Ezra chapter 8. The last time we met, well, we read verses 1 through 14, which is a lengthy list of names and some genealogy, which don't uh, elicit a lot of commentary as a rule. So let's continue with another big section, and we'll glean what we can glean from it. That's going to be verses 15 through 23. Let's begin there at verse 15. And I gathered them together to the river that runneth to Ahava, and uh, there abode we in tents three days. And I viewed the people and the priests, and found there none of the sons of Levi. Then sent I for Eleazar, for Ariel, for Shemaiah, and for Elnathan, and for Jared, and for Elnathan, uh, and for and for Nathan, and for Zechariah, and for Meshulam, chief men also of Joiarib, and for Elnathan, men of understanding. And I sent them with commandment unto Ido, the chief at the place Cassiphia, and I told them what they should say unto Ido, and to his brethren the Nethanims at the place Cassiphia, that they should bring unto, the minister, bring unto us ministers for the house of our God. And by the good hand of our, uh, excuse me, and by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sheribia with his sons and his brethren eighteen, and Hashabiah and with him Jeshaiah of the sons of Merari, his brethren and their sons twenty, also of the Nethanims, whom David and the princes had appointed for the service of the Levites, two hundred and twenty Nephilims, all of them were expressed by name. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahaba, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek him a right way for us, and for our little ones, and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. Then I, did I stop there at oh, verse 23? Okay, so we'll stop there. Ezra is uh, writing a brief account of his trip to Jerusalem and now back to uh, gather Jews to come and leave the provinces of Babylon or the Persian Empire now, and head back to Jerusalem. And he conducts a roll call of those who are returning from Babylon. And we're told he did this by the river uh, Hava in verse 15, and for three days. Uh, I think he said there in um, verse 21, And for three days, and uh, Ahava, the, the actual river, has not been perfectly identified. Check a number of different Bible maps and dictionaries, and um, but it's pretty well agreed by it was still within the territories of Babylon or the Persian Empire um, at this particular time, which is supplanted the Babylonians. And... Um, and for three days they are there, and he says he found there none of the sons of Levi. Now, obviously, you can't take up this priesthood ministry again without the rightful priests that God had ordained, the, the Levites. So he immediately sends a message back to Persia, which is called Cassiphia, in verse 17. And uh, by the men who he's listed in verse 16... Then sent I for Eleazar, for Ariel, for Shemaiah, and for Elnathan, and for Jared, and for Elnathan, that must be another one, and for Nathan, and for Zechariah, and for Meshulam, chief men also for Joiarib, and for Elnathan, men of understanding. Well, at least three men, perhaps, with the same name in that verse. And he sends them back to uh, re-enlist the Levites for the service God had given them. Uh, verse 17, he says, And I told them what they should say unto Ido, and so forth. 
And in the next verse, we're told that the good hand of God shows up to answer Ezra's uh, petitions. And this is the same expression that he uh, used back in chapter 7, verse 28, where he said, I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, which we discussed um, uh, the last time, too, a couple of weeks back. And we defined it as God's protective good fortune upon a man. It's the working of God's will in, corrupt, or in cooperation or in response to man's free will. Those two things have to uh, operate uh, together. We don't believe that God uh, decides our lives ahead of time and we have no choosing or free will to decide our course of action or what we're going to do. Uh, like the Calvinists suggest, ultra, ultra Calvinists suggest. And we don't believe that all of our life is entirely up to us, as a lot of the uh, charismatic or Pentecostal brethren might suggest, that you can get closer to God, you can lose your salvation based upon your level of obedience. But we believe that uh, our will has come in line and, with God's will. Um, the Bible says God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. So that states what God's will is. He doesn't want you to perish, but are you willing to repent? So those things have to work together. And we mentioned that, I think, the last time we met. Um, and the Nephilims mentioned down in verse 17, I think, and also verse 20, uh, and elsewhere in the Bible, are temple servants. They're not from the tribe of Levi, but their jobs were to minister to the Levitical priesthood. Now Ezra uh, reacts with, or resorts rather, to fasting and prayer to see the petitions fulfilled and these things accomplished. Verse 21, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. The Lord said, certain hard cases uh, in the New Testament, in this, for example, uh, when the disciples could not cast out uh, the devils of a man, he said, Matthew 17, verse 2, how be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Certain hard cases in your spiritual life are going to require uh, more determination on your part to see answers uh, come. Now, Ezra wants to get the lawful priests back to the city of Jerusalem and take up their divine duties once again. And God gave the land of Palestine and Jerusalem to the descendants of Abraham through Isaac. He did not give them to anyone else in the world. He didn't give them to uh, white uh, Anglo-Europeans uh, represented by the Catholic popes. He didn't give them to anybody in China or the Far East and uh, or, or anyone in Africa. In fact, the, the Canaanites were out of their area. Um, Canaan, the son of Ham, uh, God, um, God said would be a servant to the Gentile, or to, to the Japhethites, the white Gentiles, and to the uh, Shemites, the descendants of Abraham. And um, the in two or three places in the book of Psalms, Egypt and Africa are referred to as the land of Ham. So the African continent was given to the descendants of Ham, undoubtedly the black race. <coughs> Ham, in fact, the Hebrew word Ham means burnt. And uh, the land of Canaan, so named because the Canaanites were dwelling, where God intended to give, the land that God intended to give to Abraham's descendants. So they had to be driven out when Israel got there. That's so why God didn't give the land to them. He didn't give it to the um, Chinese. He didn't give it to the Europeans. And nor did he give it to the Muslims or the Arabs. He gave it to the Jews, the descendants of Abraham. Um, and he made that promise to them uh, a total of eight times as you read the book of Genesis in that one book. And if the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the same God worshipped by Muslims, Allah, as they say, and as all the modern popes seem to agree, Pope John Paul II, 
um, held these conferences and these meetings of all these different religious groups and um, sought to imply that the, the same God of the Jew and the Christian, or the God, rather, of the Jew and the Christian is the same God of the Muslims, and that we're all worshiping and praying to the same God. Well, if the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the same God as the Muslims, then what is going to be done with verses like Galatians 4, verse 30? And you don't need to turn. Let me read it to you. Nevertheless, what saith the Scriptures? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman, citing Genesis 21. And the free woman was Sarah, the mother of the Jews, and the bondwoman was Hagar, the mother of the Arab peoples and the supposed mother of the Muslim people. Now, the Lord God of the Bible is very clear about who the land belongs to and who it does not belong to. Now let's continue reading verses 24 through 30. Then I separated twelve of the chief of the priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten of their brethren with them, and weighed unto them the weighed unto them the silver and the gold and the vessels, even the offering of the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel there present had offered. I even weighed unto I even weighed under their hand, 650 talents of silver, and silver vessels, and 100 talents, and of gold, and 100 talents. And uh, tw also 20 basins of gold of a 1,000 grams, and two vessels of fine copper, precious as gold. And I said unto them, Ye are holy unto the Lord, the vessels are holy also, and the silver and the gold are a freewill offering unto the Lord God of your fathers. Watch ye, and keep them, until you weigh them before the chief of the priests and the Levites, and the chief of the fathers of Israel at Jerusalem, in the chambers of the house of the Lord. So took the priests and the Levites the weight of the silver and the gold and the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem under the house of our God. Ezra says back in verse 22, I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers uh, and horses and so forth that is to escort them back to Jerusalem as armed guards, some protection uh, in route from Babylon back to Jerusalem. Because he had already stated that God would protect them in their labors, as he said there in uh, verse 22. But here, uh, there are some stewards with some very valuable goods, verses 26 to 28, and who are being charged with a very serious matter, that is the, the transporting of a couple million dollars worth of gold and silver back to Jerusalem and not be uh, waylaid by road bandits and robbers. Um, verses 31 through 36. Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go unto Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy, and of such as lay in wait by the way. Those would be robbers on the, on the, uh, on the way there. You know, there were, um, there is one route all the way into uh, India and China, which was called the Silk Road. And it was a route of uh, traveling from the Far East all the way over to the Mediterranean and the, and the European nations, these countries had trade with one another centuries and centuries ago. We sometimes don't think that they were that technical or advanced, but they knew about each other. All of these societies knew about each other. The, the, the country of India is named about two or three times in the book of uh, Esther. And so these nations knew about each other. They had trade with one another. And um, they traversed over land from Europe all the way over to as far as uh, India and perhaps even China, centuries before the Lord Jesus even uh, was born. And uh, same similar routes from Babylon all the way westward to Jerusalem and Palestine. And along the way, you're going to find robbers who want to take advantage of some small caravan and rob them and murder if necessary. But... 
Uh, let's continue reading verses 31 through 36. Um, and we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go unto Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and of such as lay in wait by the way. And we came to Jerusalem and abode there three days. Now on the fourth day was the silver and the gold and the vessels weighed in the house of our God by the hand of Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the priest, and with him was Eleazar, the son of Phinehas, and with them was Josephad, the son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, the son of Benui, Levites. By number and by weight of every one, and all the weight was written at that time. Also the children of those that had been carried away, which were come out of the captivity, offered burnt offerings unto the Lord, unto the God of Israel, twelve bullocks for all Israel, ninety and six rams, seventy and seven lambs, twelve he goats for a sin offering. All this was a burnt offering unto the Lord. And they delivered the king's commissions unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors on this side of the river, and they furthered the people and the house of God. Um, up shows the hand of God again in verse 31. Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem, and the hand of our God was upon us. And uh, Ezra's prayer, verses, back in verses 22 and 23, gets answered. <coughs> they reach Jerusalem uh, unharmed, unmolested, unrobbed, and they left their place at Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month, and that would be the first month of a Hebrew calendar called Abib in the book of Genesis, or rather the book of Exodus. And the record doesn't tell us how long it took their, them the journey to Jerusalem, uh, but God led them from the hand of the enemy and of such as lay in wait by the way, robbers. Verse 32 says, And we came to Jerusalem and abode there three days. After a long journey, you're, you're more than uh, eager to rest. So let's rest for three days, and on the fourth day, we'll reconvene and tend to these matters. And we'll regather at verse 33. At verse 36, one more time. And they delivered the king's commissions unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors on this side of the river, and they furthered the people and the house of God. The river being uh, the river Euphrates, this side, that side, this side, that side. You'll see that phrase many times uh, to describe the, the, the locale. Um, the, uh, what's called archaic English, verse 36, they furthered the people and the house of God, uh, does not mean it's a meaningless term. But archaic means um, modern speakers don't use the word in their speech or their writing very often. It's just fallen out of common use. Not that it's uh, not a, a fine word to use, but it's just not commonly used. Uh, they furthered uh, is matched by Paul in the New Testament, Philippians 1.12. But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. That is, to further means to help, to assist in the completion of the task, whether it was proclaiming the gospel of Christ, or in this case, rebuilding the temple at Jerusalem. Now that's about all the commentary I, I can offer to you tonight, uh, except to, to remind you that God was very clear about who gets the land of Israel, the land of Palestine. And the land that Israel, um, the state of Israel, sits on today is not even the entire land God promised to Abraham and his descendants. He said that land would go all the way over to the river Euphrates and then up to, uh, I forget the name of the town, north, north end, but a much larger piece of land for their permanent inheritance not just the state of Israel as we see it on the maps today, but all the land uh, that is currently occupied by Muslim peoples and Arab peoples 
who are not the rightful inheritance or inheritors of that part of the world. And uh, the rest of the world, by extension, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and begins to reign as the king of Israel and the king of the entire planet. And it's going to be an interesting configuration of nations and peoples after the rapture, after the tribulation has run its course and the Lord Jesus comes back, it's probably safe to assume most of the nations, the geographic territories of countries today will still exist even seven, after, after the tribulation is over and uh, the Lord Jesus has uh, destroyed the, or bound the Antichrist in uh, the bottomless pit. And most of the nations and their geographic boundaries will probably still be there. And uh, what forms of government each nation will have will be probably irrelevant at the time because the Lord Jesus will be an absolute one world uh, monarchical dictator. And there won't be anyone standing up smarting off to the Lord Jesus with some uh, objection. Nobody's going to protest what he says or have the right to do so. And with <clears throat> saints, from the church, now made glorified in resurrected bodies, immortal and incorruptible, <clears throat> made to uh, uh, appear like the image of the glorified Son of God. You won't be able to go anywhere without running into someone bearing the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I will undoubtedly be part of that um, enforcement of the rules of the Lord Jesus Christ, if for lack of a better expression. <clears throat> and what a time that's going to be. But, um, <clears throat> and when we think about it, there's really nothing more important that we have on our schedules than to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. I, the rapture could take place right now, and uh, I don't have anything more important that, that's more pressing than that. <clears throat> 